Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to the podcast. We're very, very excited for this particular podcast. We have the one and only Andy Sheckman joining us, the CEO and co-founder of Miles Franklin, who's going to be talking all things global reset and how that ties to the precious metals and commodities market, which he has subject matter expertise. If you are new to the channel, please do like, subscribe, and share so that others can gain the knowledge that you have been afforded today. Andy, thank you for joining us, and thank you so much for being on our podcast. It is great to be here, John. Thanks for having me, my friend. Oh, it's it's an honor, believe me. We always enjoy you and uh, your colleague, Bill Holter, as you know, he comes on monthly. I'm just going to read your bio a little bit so everybody knows a uh, cursory background for those who might not be familiar with your work. And he is the president of Miles Franklin. He has been a prominent figure in the financial services industry for over 25 years. He has distinguished himself as a reputable speaker on economics, global investing, and foreign currencies. And he's here to assist for anyone who needs uh, precious metals advice or IRA, IRA, excuse me, 401k or IRA conversions, which we'll talk about towards the end of the show. Sure. Okay, so Andrew, we're going to dive right in. Uh, this is what we do here. We get to the to the elephant in the room, and and this is uh, no stranger for you. Um, in a recent X, a recent X22 video, you probably saw your colleague Bill Holter with uh, Dave on Resurrection Day. Um, Dave came out and asked a question that I've been waiting in this community to be asked for several years. And it was something that definitely got my attention to the point of me almost falling off my chair. He actually asked Bill if we were going to have a global currency reset of all the currencies, the dinar, the dong, the boulevard, the bot, all the other different countries we all know. And he said, absolutely. And it would be based in precious metals and asset commodities. So I wanted to ask you up front, did he mean there will be an event where there'll be an actual reset or is it tied to BRICS? And do you feel that the bonds like the Zim bonds, the Chinese bonds, the bearer bonds, the German bearer bonds, as well as certain cryptos like XRP, XL, and XDC, all these mechanisms will in fact reset under precious metals? And if so, why? Yeah, I mean, I don't know how all of those things like XRP and, and the various bonds and whatnot will all play into the reset, but I do 100% believe that we are in the midst of a reset. And it doesn't surprise me, Bill believes that. Bill always speaks from the hip. He's a dear friend of mine, and, and he and I have talked about resets uh, for many years. In fact, his his former partner, uh, Jim, Sin Jim Sinclair, and I talked about it a decade ago together over dinner, where he believed that there would be two resets, first day man-made reset, which you could argue we're in the midst of right now that would fail and then a mother nature reset uh, after. But yeah, I think that, it, you know, th that's a, a question that I think needs, you know, it's going to be a long answer. I hope you're okay with that. But I think there is a, sure there is a, a progression of events that, that I've seen happening now for four years that I've done thousands of YouTube videos on over the last four years on this topic. And I've been very consistent for four years and i'm not the kind of guy that pats myself on the back john but what scares the hell out of me as a father of three kids my youngest being not 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 17 yet um is that i've been right and the speed at which it's happening is frightening me and, and it should frighten other people the problem is the media in the west does does not just a poor job they don't they do no job of telling us what's happening outside the border that's really important that's really relevant and and the bricks are certainly one of it so let's um let's let's lay this out and i'll let your listeners decide if we are in the midst of a reset or not um and excuse me for the length of the answer but if for people who haven't heard me talk you know this is this is the crux of my my entire belief um and it started really in 2017 and in, in 2017, we were in the tail end of a six-year bear market in metals where they had gone straight down for six straight years. And it was a tough time to own a precious metals company. Bitcoin was starting to take off and the stock market was doing well. And we didn't have the things that we see in this country right now, um, lawlessness, divisiveness, censorship, wokeness open borders, uh, questions surrounding the electoral process, questions surrounding the judicial system, all of this stuff, as we get to the end, you will see, will, sh will factor into my belief why this is happening. Bill coined the phrase, it's too stupid to be stupid. And I agree with Bill on that. This, in my opinion, is all planned. Now, 
most people wouldn't have the courage to say that publicly. I do believe that it is planned, and I'll explain why as we go through this, and maybe you'll even be able to, to see that uh, as we move through yourself. So if we go back to 2017, one of the things that we will notice is the German Bundesbank started this all off by making a very public declaration after three years of trying in vain to get their goal that the United States or the New York Fed was holding on their behalf to send it back to Germany. And there were articles written in Wall Street Journal and, and all over the place about this very public decree. We want our gold back. That was unusual because, you know, for the previous six years, central banks were actually shedding gold and gold had been falling. So why were they making such a big deal about it? Well, this is when it all began and caught my attention. And I started to speak about this publicly in conferences before YouTubes. And within a few months of that happening, the Bank of Austria, Bank of Hungary, Bank of Turkey, Bank of Poland, the Czech National Bank, the Dutch National Bank, all sorts of these Eastern European banks, well, they said the same thing to the New York Fed and the Bank of England. We want our gold back too. Give it back. So now I'm really interested in what I'm seeing and something is going on and no one's talking about it, but it's very strange. As gold is going down, we see this broad repatriation effort by the, the central banks of Eastern Europe. The following year in 2018, um, the those same banks bought more gold as a group than they did in the previous 60 years combined. And so now all of a sudden, they're not just repatriating, they're going on a massive buying spree. Now I'm really interested in this. And this is when I start really focusing on it and talking about it. Because in 2019, everything changed. And in 2019, those banks who had bought more as a group together in 18 than they did in the 60 years previously combined, the following year, they bought almost double that amount. They increased it by 100%. And then out of nowhere, I guess it's coincidence, huh? Uh, no, it's not. The Bank of International Settlements, and I would call this probably the biggest event of my career, which is the central bank or central bank in Basel, Switzerland, um, the most influential bank on the planet. They reclassify gold as the world's only other tier one asset. Since the end of World War II, there's been one tier one asset, or really two, U.S. Treasuries and U.S. dollars, a riskless asset. And then out of nowhere, after almost 70 years, they say, by the way, guys, gold is now a tier one asset. And you have to ask yourself, was there coincidence in the central banks going on a repatriation and then on a buying binge? And I think not. So this is when I really started to talk about things online and, and starting with this. And, and then things just started to go on this linear progression of events faster and faster and faster. So 2020 rolls along and I start talking about this new phenomenon that no one was talking about that everyone ought to know about. And that is the Chinese belt road and rail initiative. Uh, it's the largest infrastructure project in human history. It is uh, connecting in essence, Asia, uh, Africa, um, South America, parts of Europe. As it is right now, it is roughly 75% of human population, 50% of global GDP. Every OPEC country is on the Belt Road Initiative. Every OPEC country is on the Belt Road Initiative. It is a system of bridges and roads and railways and maritime channels um, and, and pathways that most of which completely evade and sidestep the U.S. Navy interference uh, that will only be patrolled by commerce and by military. It is not for the public. It is a, it's the Panama Canal on steroids. And uh, now I'm really starting to get interested. And the banks are, are massively buying gold. And, and we see the rise of this group in 2020 called the Others on the COMEX. And I don't want to get too deep into that, but the COMEX would, the Commodity Exchange in Chicago every week would publish a, a report called the Commitment of Traders. And it would show the, the positioning of the largest traders on the exchange. And it was always the commercial banks on one side and the speculators on the other, specs and commercials. And one would go long, the other would go short. And that was it. And then out of nowhere, we see the rise of a third group of reportables called the Others. 
Who are they? They're believed to be sovereign wealth funds who started draining the exchanges, who took delivery of more silver in 2020 than we would typically see in a decade, who took delivery of more gold in, in 2020 than uh, the Bank of Japan has in their official holdings. These are, are very, very big deliveries that we started to see. I'm really getting interested. So you have massive deliveries on a new group of reportables off the COMEX where virtually no one stood for delivery. You have the central banks on a buying spree. You have the central banks on a repatriation spree. And you have the the starting to the, the growing trend of the Belt Road Initiative and all of the countries and, and the OPEC countries that were part of it. 2021 rolls along and we start to see things really ramping up. The, the banks are are still continuing to buy gold. Uh, the Belt Road Initiative is, is beginning to exert itself, but we start to hear the rumblings of this group called the BRICS in Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa. And we start to hear rumblings of other countries wanting to join the BRICS. And well, it made it made sense in, in many respects to me. I'll get to that in a moment. But the... The, the the trend really started to change uh, in um, August of, I guess it would have been 2022, I want to say, when the United States left, I think it was 2022. Uh, my, it could be 2021, 2022, I forget, but you'll get what I'm saying. And the, when we left off Afghanistan, I think it was August 2021, um, I believe. We can fact check that for me. But Anyways, when we left, we left in a way that was very un-American. We left with people hanging from a transport plane. We left with 3,000 Americans behind enemy lines. This was stuff that we would never do. And more, almost more egregiously, we, we turned our back on the interpreters and the freedom fighters who we had promised visas for. We left them behind enemy lines uh, for, you know, with their, with their uh, biometrics given to the Taliban. And, and there's a a movie uh, called The Covenant uh, that that I think people should watch that that talks about this. It shows how this how this happened and how horrible it was. And families were hiding from the Taliban and moving constantly because they were being hunted down as traitors for helping the Western uh, the, the Western Army, the the U.S. and 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 this was not lost on our allies, and it was also not lost on our foes because here's where things really started to get interesting. And uh, that was the fact that um, the Saudis signed a joint military cooperation agreement three days later with Russia. Now, why is that a big deal? It's a big deal because since 1973, the United States has had its reserve status, if you will, the petrodollar status in place because of our protection of the Saudi kingdom. You know, we we were the world reserve currency from the end of World War II until 1971. We were our currency was backed by gold, and countries could exchange their gold at a fixed rate or their dollars rather at a fixed rate of 35 bucks an ounce, and and so the dollar wasn't in in effect as good as gold, and it was that way until 71 when President de Gaulle from France realized we were printing more money to fund the guns and butter endeavor in the Vietnam War than we had gold at Fort Knox. And he sent warships over to New York Harbor filled with dollars and said, give us back the gold. And we did, bled down half of the, the gold at the treasury and Nixon closed the gold window. So at that point, our currency is fiat, but it was two years later in 73 that Henry Kissinger struck a deal with the Saudis. And he said, look, we're gonna protect you. We're gonna give you munitions and no one will ever mess with the Saudi kingdom. But for that, you, and by extension, OPEC will value oil in dollars. And, and it's been that way for the last 50 years. So when Saudi Arabia signed a joint military cooperation agreement three days after we left Afghanistan in a horribly un-American way, that was not coincidental in terms of its timing. Two days later, the, Russia announced the exact same thing with Nigeria, both, of course, OPEC-producing countries. I started screaming at that moment the the end of the dollar hegemony is upon us that for 50 years, every just about 100% of all oil sales have been 
in dollars because of our protection of the Saudi kingdom, and now there's someone else protecting them? Do people not see this as a problem? And oh, by the way, every OPEC country's on the Belt Road Initiative. Do people not see this as a problem? But then it started to get way worse. And the following year, uh, we start to see Saudi Arabia um, react to our foolish president who signs an executive order to go green. Now you have President Biden who says, yeah, we're, we're going to go green. Uh, and it's the linchpin of the dollar hegemony is, is our relationship with Saudi Arabia. So we say we're going to go green. Now, what does Saudi Arabia do? Well, we already know they joined the, the Belt Road Initiative. They formally apply to the BRICS and have subsequently been approved. We know that. They joined the BRICS New Development Bank. <clears throat> they joined the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, which is the largest regional financial and military organization on the planet. They go to Davos, the World Bank meeting, and they tell everyone that we're open to taking other currencies for oil. Do you see a growing trend here? Now, in 2023, things got really bad. And in 2023, we weaponized the dollar against Russia. And now you have our brain-dead Treasury Secretary uh, flying all around the world, last in, in Brazil, which is in Russia's backyard as a member of BRICS, and saying, not only do we need to sanction the assets of, of um, Russia, but we need to confiscate the $380 billion in Forex reserves, and we need to use it to fund the Ukrainian effort. You cross that line of weaponization and confiscation, there will never be a country for sure in the Southern Hemisphere, let alone most of the world that will ever trust us again. Now, as, before I keep going, I want people to understand that there is an economic advisor to the United States government. He is the number one chief economic advisor, the number one guy in the U.S. government, a man named Jared Bernstein. This fool has a degree in music and a master's degree in social work, but he is our lead economic advisor to President Biden. His thesis is to lose the world reserve status. It is a privilege we can no longer afford. He has written reports called Dethrone King Dollar that were picked up in the New York Times. He, When Trump slapped tariffs on China, he said, good, maybe now we'll lose part of the reserve status. He advocates for its removal. Now, from a standpoint of doing things internationally, the two things that you would do if you wanted to lose the reserve status, number one, you would sign an executive order to go green because after all, the dollar hegemony is the petrodollar. And number two, you would sanction and confiscate assets of, of your adversaries. Now, I want to talk about the way the world, as I continue down this progression, looks at the United States. We invaded Iraq. 20 years ago under the guise of weapons, to mass, of, of weapons of mass destruction, and oh, sorry, we didn't find them. But we're still here 20 years later, occupying your country, sanctioning 14 of your banks or having the audacity of trying to buy liquid natural gas using Iranian intermediary banks that were on the do not play list. So we're sanctioning 14 of their banks. And do you know that last year, Iraq made 95 billion in oil revenue. They're not allowed to direct the proceeds of their own natural resources. It's held at the New York Fed. And they asked us at the end of the year for a billion dollars. We said, not right now, it's not a good time. And so what did they do? They've just announced they're kicking out of the country all Western coalition forces. They have formally applied to BRICS. They have made trading in dollars illegal. If you do, you own a business, you'll go to jail and you'll lose your business. And as of January 1 this year, all dollar bills were removed from the banks, all of them, the green bills throughout all of Iraq. The world looks at us as being hypocritical that we can do this and we can go in under false pretenses, destroy a country, destabilize it, occupy it for 20 years, uh, control their natural resources, and there's no repercussions. But, and I'm not defending Putin or war or any of this stuff, but when they do this, if we don't like it, no, you know what? We're going to confiscate your assets and give it to the other side. As the, the administrator of the world reserve currency, it is not for us to make that decision, maybe for world opinion, but not for us. So we've weaponized the dollar. We've signed an executive order to go green. And this is where it begins. Now you look at, you know, I, I say to people, well, heck, you know, if this country was what it was, you know, John, when we were kids, um, maybe we'd make it through it, you know, uh, whenever this country has had its back against the wall. Look, I'm a patriot as can be. This country has given me so many blessings, it's unbelievable. And I thank God every day that I was born in the United States and the opportunities it gave me. But what I see happening, you have to wonder, is it lost on our foes and on our allies? We are a country that is divided. 
blue and red and black and white and rich and poor and vaccine and no vaccine. And you're defined by who you voted for in the last election. And everyone's angry and everyone, there is no discourse. There is no, you know, you go to Thanksgiving and your wife says not a damn word this time. At least my wife says it, not a damn word this time. I would like to enjoy my dinner. Do not say a word to, you know, him and to her. Shut up. Okay, fine. We're a, we're a country that has open borders where 12 million people have entered illegally. We are a country who has lawlessness in its major cities. We are a country where people are wondering, are the elections fair? We are a country who are wondering, is the Justice Department administering justice equally? We are a country that is having its culture whitewashed and, and its identity destroyed. We are not what we once were, and that is not lost on the rest of the world. So now let's kind of put it all together, right? We have a situation where, you know, the lead economic advisor is advocating to get rid of the world reserve status. We've weaponized the dollar. We've signed an executive order to go green. We've destabilized the inside of our country. We are $155 trillion in debt. We have $5 trillion in assets, according to the 2022 balance sheet. 2023, I don't think has come out yet. Maybe it did, but it will say roughly the same thing. The largest asset of the land of the free and the home of the brave is student debt of $1.6 trillion. The government considers it debt. You cannot even bankrupt yourself out of it. They'll take your Social Security. And when our foolish president wants to give $10 billion away, that's a drop in the bucket. It's illegal, and it's a drop in the bucket. But it is the largest asset of this country uh, of only $5 trillion. We're almost 130% debt to GDP, a, a level that I don't think anyone has ever come back for from once you cross it, either by default or hyperinflation. It ends badly. So, you know, it, it's a situation where you have to ask yourself, you know, could this actually be intended? And 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 I do believe it is actually intended because we are at this place right now where we have, you know, a trillion seconds ago was 31,688 years ago. And we have 155 trillion in debt, 77 trillion unfunded in social security. The, the Congressional Budget Office just came out and said by 2031, which doesn't even take into account the 12 million people who came in here illegally and, we, and who's going to pay for their housing and their schooling and their medical. But the point of it is, is that the Congressional Budget Office, who is, is nonpartisan, they came out and said by 2031, 100% of tax revenue will have to go to pay just the interest on the debt and mandatory entitlement like Social Security. So how does a country re retain its supremacy, both military and financially, when 100% of, of discretional spending, which includes military, would have to be borrowed? We're broke. We're insolvent. We are wayward as a country. We have told the world, if you're not lined with us ideolo ideologically, watch out. We're going to confiscate your assets. We've weaponized the dollar. We've signed an executive order to go green. Is it too stupid to be stupid? Now ask yourself, why would they do this? Well, you know, Jared Bernstein thinks we can't afford it anymore and that this is something that should happen. But we are broke. We are insolvent. And my mentor, Richard Russell, always used to say, 15 years ago, the Fed had already crossed the point of no return. They have two choices, inflate or die, inflate or default. How about option number three? Find a villain. That villain is Xi Jinping and Putin and OPEC. How dare they do this to us after all we've done? Do you know the crown prince of Saudi Arabia came out and said last year, China was our most important trading partner this year and for the next 50. Now, he chose those words carefully. It was 50 years ago that we did the petrodollar deal, but we're going green. So, Look at it this way. We have a villain. We incentivize all of these countries to unite against the Western hegemony and dump dollars as a result of it no longer being the petrodollar, because after all, we're going green. We weaponize the dollar to make damn sure they understand that yeah, if we're not aligned ideologically, better find an alternate route. That has created safety in numbers and this cohesion of the BRICS nations, which was five and is now 10, including Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, Egypt, Ethiopia, you know, you're talking, and Iran, you're talking all of these countries that produce all of the oil, control the Red Sea, control the Straits of Hormuz, and another 36 have formally applied, which will be announced in the big meeting in October in Russia, not to mention the 200 meetings that lead up to this big meeting for the BRICS meeting, where all of these new countries will be admitted, or those that are will be admitted. So we've incentivized everyone to do this. and. 
this is the Klaus Schwab moment. This is the moment where a country that has held interest rates at zero for almost 20 years and flooded the world with money over the last several years, creating distortions in asset prices at super high levels, all inversely correlated to a spike in interest rates. This is the Klaus Schwab moment. How does it happen? Saudi Arabia and the rest of OPEC who are all on the Belt Road Initiative, all of them on the Belt Road Initiative, <clears throat> and all, lots of them joining BRICS and the ones that are now applying, a lot of them are OPEC members. And, and so they say, listen, we thank you for the, for the protection of the last 50 years. Um, we understand you're going green. Um, we really don't like what you've done to Iran and to Russia, who are our BRICS brethren. Um, and, you know, we don't align ideologically. We've decided to no longer take oil for dollars. Now, this isn't uh, something that is that out of the ordinary to think it can happen. The United Arab Emirates just made this admission just a few weeks ago, three days before they had 200 delegates from the United Nations uh, around the world at a United Nations summit um, in, in Dubai on climate change. And it was ironically presided over by the chairman of the state-owned oil company who said, just so you all know, if we do this, you're going back to the caves. Two days before they all came, he said, by the way, we don't want to take dollars for oil anymore. They were just admitted into BRICS. They're the seventh largest producer of oil in the world. They are an OPEC producer. Iran isn't doing it anymore, uh, and, and nor is Russia. They're OPEC producers. So you're, you're looking at a situation where we have incentivized all of these countries through weaponizing of the dollar and going green to find safety in numbers. That's what Jared Bernstein wants. And they say, look, thank you for everything, but we're not going to take dollars anymore. And every single country on the planet that has had to stockpile dollars for the last 50 years in order to buy oil, that was the petrodollar deal. We value oil in dollars and the proceeds, the excess proceeds, we reinvest in treasuries. So now we've told them, look, look at the treasury market over the last year and a half. It's destroyed people. It's it's gotten obliterated, right? We're, we're choosing inflation over austerity. We're inflating away the currency. The bond market is a mess. We've incentivized all these people to seek alternatives to the dollar. We're going green. We're weaponizing the dollar. So these countries like China, who used to have three trillion in treasuries, are down to seven hundred billion. They are slowly shedding the treasuries. Russia has gone; had, all of them are gone. Saudi Arabia—they're all selling treasuries. And what are they doing? They're buying gold, which is the only other tier one reserve asset. And gold, and compared to the treasury market since the beginning of two thousand, over the last twenty-four years, has outperformed it by a massive magnitude. But more importantly, it has no counterparty risk. It has no default risk, and it sure as hell cannot be confiscated from these countries the way that their forex reserves can. So these countries are are striking deals with one another right now before a common settlement currency comes out, where they're trading with one another in their local currencies, like Brazil. The second largest exporter of corn in the world is selling corn and soybeans to China, accepting yuan instead of dollars in payment. And those yuan are immediately convertible into gold on the Shanghai Gold Exchange. What is gold? The only other tier one asset. Iran is doing that with China, selling oil, sidestepping sanctions, getting yuan, switching them into gold on the Shanghai Gold Exchange. We're seeing this all over the place. So if this happens, and they say, we're not going to take dollars anymore for oil. Thank you for the memories, you guys. You're going green. It's just better that we go a different direction with all of our brothers and sisters on the Belt Road Initiative. And if you put together the Belt Road Initiative, the BRICS, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, and the Eurasian Economic Union, they will all come together. I've been saying that for four years. And the president of Belarus just said that we need to have a summit to bring together the Shanghai Cooperation Organization and the Eurasian Economic Union into the BRICS. If you put them all together, it's about 90% of human population. It is the majority of all of the commodities on the planet. It is a far superior military might, two of the three largest nuclear arsenals on the planet, actually three of the four, uh, and the majority of the shipping lanes, the majority of the rare earth metals, the majority of the oil production, you name it. And if we allow this to happen, or, or if it does happen, and they say, we're going to no longer take it, we're taking a new BRICS settlement currency, or we're going to take yuan, or we're going to take gold, or whatever it is, like that, 
Every country on the planet dumps dollars. They have no interest in holding them anymore. That synthetic demand dies. And like in the final scene of Trading Places, where one Duke brother says to the other, sell a more to Marcel as he's watching his fortune evaporate, dies of a heart attack right there on the floor. That's what all these countries will do. Sell, 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 dump dollars, dump dollars. Those dollars will hit our shore, creating a tsunami of inflation. Now, here's your Klaus Schwab moment. Stocks, bonds, real estate, the banking system, and the insurance companies that are about 90% loaded with treasuries, they all blow up because they are all inversely correlated to a spike in interest rates. Richard Russell always said, inflate or default. We are at that point where we have no ability to pay back $155 trillion in debt. How do we do it? Well, we can inflate, we can default, or we find a villain. And those sons of bitches dump the dollar and the petrodollar. And every country on the planet that's had to own them to buy oil dumps dollars and creates hyperinflation just like that. And interest rates spike to compensate for that massive loss in purchasing power, where you can have 30% inflation and 5% interest rates. Everything in this country that makes people feel wealthy is inversely correlated to that moment. And... And, and the dollar gets dumped at the same time. So every pillar of wealth, dollars, stocks, bonds, real estate, and then the banks, which are over leveraged and undercapitalized, as are the insurance companies, inversely correlate to a real spike in interest rates. Not the pussyfooting around that Powell has done, almost breaking the system at 5%, but way higher. And now you point to them. They did it to us. How could they do it to us? But have no fear, because the number two economic advisor is here, Lael Brainerd. Lael Brainerd worked at the Treasury for a few years, and then she was recently at the Fed underneath Powell as vice chair, where she ran point with MIT on the development of the new central bank digital currency that, that Biden fast-tracked by executive order. And she also just worked with um, uh, the development of FedNow, which came out about six months ago, which is being um, beta tested on a handful of banks. It's like Venmo or Zelle backed by the Fed. It will very quickly replace checks and wires if it is allowed to go through. It is instant settlement backed by the Fed. It's a digital form of settlement rather than checks and wires. She's now number two. She left the Fed and is number two economic advisor to the Biden administration. She is a modern monetary theorist. So when everything blows up, the banks, the real estate, the, the insurance companies, um, you know, everything, have no fear, folks. Lael Brainerd is here. Sign on the dotted line, take the new central bank digital currency, and you too will be made whole. Now, I do believe the ultimate goal, either by the BRICS or by the West, will be to tie peg gold to a new reserve currency that will be digitally based. And the BRICS are talking about this. In fact, there's something that that is very interesting. Just came out the other day. There was a report that came out. It was... It was um, it was an interview with one of the Russian finance ministers, and he came out, they've been saying this for three years, that there will be a basket of local currencies of the countries involved and then a basket of commodities. I want to read you what he said, because it's really, really, really interesting. He said, the idea of the currency is that they're going to be two baskets. One basket will be national currencies, the countries involved, and the second will be commodities. It will be in a digital form, which means it can be used without the banking system. So it will be at least 10 times cheaper than the present transactions. But here's where it gets interesting. He says, and I've been saying this for three years, this is the second part, he says, is price for the moment. Price is determined by Western speculation. We produce these commodities, we consume them, but we do not have our own price mechanism, which will balance supply and demand. During the COVID pandemic, the price of oil fell to nearly zero. Now he's wrong there, went to negative 40 a barrel. But it's impossible to make any strategic planning for economic development if you not, do not control the prices of basic commodities. Price formation with this new currency should get rid of the Western ex exchanges of commodities. So they understand What's happening in the West where you can create massive rehypothecation and and sell and and, and um, tremendous amount of of claims on the same goal and suppress the price of gold by doing that. And 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 the people buying it don't even have to buy it. They just have money in their margin account. So we make believe that you're getting gold by rehypothecating digital gold. And you make believe you pay for it by maintaining a margin account. And and that way we can 
way, way, way sell more gold and silver than there is really available and we can control the price. Well, this has been going on for a long time and the West is falling right into the hands of the rest of the world who has been buying gold at a level over the last three years that the world has never seen, the central banks. They are replacing bonds that they're selling with buying gold. And in fact, right now in Shanghai, on the Shanghai Gold Exchange, silver is priced three plus dollars higher than it is in London and Chicago, and gold is about 80 bucks higher. Silver opened up yesterday morning, 7% limit up at triggered stops on the Shanghai exchange. Their prices are going through the roof and they are willing to arbitrage the hell out of everything that's not nailed down where the traders in the West are, are being suckered into buying in, in London and Chicago and delivering in China. So they are building a system. By the way, the Chinese bought the London Metals Exchange uh, a couple of years ago, which are all the base metals like copper and zinc and aluminum and all the soft commodities like wheat and soybeans and corn. They're warehousing the metals that are traded on the LME in China. Do we see a problem here? They're buying all the gold, the platinum, the silver. They're striking deals building oil refineries and gold and silver mines in Africa and South America. They're bringing them into the Belt Road. They're bringing them into the BRICS. They are doing things cooperatively, mutually beneficial. They're not doing it coercively. They bought the LME. They're getting all the, the base metals. They're striking deals with Brazil, getting all the corn and the soybean, paying in yuan, which is convertible into gold, the only other tier one asset. They're doing all of this right under the nose of the West. And if and when they have enough of a mass, uh, a, a, a global mass, mass adoption, enough of, of, of all of the countries to stand up to the West, Little by little by little by little by little, they have been doing this, and then bang, all at once, they say, we're done taking dollars, and the dollar collapses, and interest rates spike, and it's the great reset. You bet your ass it's real, and I do believe it's coming. And people are too obsessed with instant gratification. This has been a 17-year endeavor for the BRICS that is accelerating rapidly right now, and I do believe Ultimately, this is by design. The West knows that they cannot and will never be able to pay off this debt. And if they raise rates, they blow everything up. If they if they go the inflation route, which all governments have chosen, ultimately that leads to higher rates and everything blows up. That's the inflator default route. So instead, find a villain. And, and one last interesting point about this happening, you know, the $155 trillion in unfunded liabilities, John, Who's it all owed to? Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, government, military pensions. It's to us. And how about the fact that all of the central banks have been dumping treasuries and buying gold? Who's been buying the treasuries? Oh, yeah, that's us. We're chasing yield. We're leaving the banks and going and buying treasuries, paying 5%. That's the hedge funds. That's the money markets. That's the individual investors. Most of it is owed to us. So when you reset this system and blame them for doing it, and, and the people in this country who don't have 30 seconds to do anything other than watch CNBC or, or CNN or, or don't do any thinking outside the box. They'll believe it. They How could they do this to us? And the whole thing blows up, but don't worry. Take the new CBDC. You'll be made whole. And when you talk about everything I have said up until that point, it's all factual. Are they doing this intentionally? Not sure. I kind of think they are to reset the system and find a villain rather than falling on the sword for brain-dead monetary and fiscal policy. We are a country that is adding $1 trillion in debt per quarter. It took over 200 years to add the first trillion. We're doing it in three months now. Mm -hmm. It is accelerating. We're getting to the end game. And when you realize that there is no way out, rather than fall on the sword, find a villain. And it is Xi Jinping and Putin and OPEC and the rest of the BRICS that are finding safety in numbers that will stand up to the West. And if the West had its, pardon my French, its shit together, and we were a country that we could all be proud of, where the borders were intact, where the elections were sound, where the Justice Department was fair and not two-tiered, where where the cities were not lawless, where a, a cop can be be beat up in, in, in broad daylight in, in Times Square and people are released where stores are getting robbed all throughout the big cities, so they're all leaving, where buildings are being sold for 10% of what they were sold for 15 years ago because no one wants to be in San Francisco or in Chicago or in New York. If all of this stuff weren't happening, where people were, were finding their way into government or being hired by big firms based upon their, their gender and their the way that they 
um, um, uh, define themselves rather than by, you know, rather by than by their merits. All of these things you have to ask, what the hell's happened to this country? Well, maybe we would be able to stand up to it, or maybe that's by design too, so that we are divided and not able to stand up to it. We are, we are not being told what's happening around the world. No one knows what the Belt Road Initiative is. No one knows that gold is tier one. No one knows what the BRICS are. No one knows that the banks can now be bailed in, it was written into law in the Dodd-Frank Act, where anything over $250,000, Goodbye, it's gone. No one knows any of this stuff. We're kept in the dark and we're focused upon stupid things that, uh, about Trump and 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 uh, just stupidity. Instead of focusing and clinging to the privilege of being the world reserve currency, we're doing everything we can to shed it and to lose it, which will then create the reset. What does the reset look like after that? I don't know. But I will tell you to your question, I am 100% certain that a reset is coming and I actually believe that it's what they want. That's certainly what what um, uh, Jared Bernstein wants. And that's what Lael Brainerd wants, the number two economic advisor, because she's a modern monetary theorist and wants to issue money directly from the Federal Reserve. So you put it all together. Yeah, you let your mind's eye go where it will. But as it pertains to the dong and the dinar and, you know, I don't know. I mean, look at what happened in Zimbabwe. They just issued a new gold-backed currency. How will it revalue? Don't know. Could be substantial. Iraq? I think that one could be real. Iraq just formally applied to BRICS. They don't want the West in there anymore. They're angry as hell at the West. They're going to find safety in numbers with the BRICS, and they're going to revalue. So are we. So could it happen? Yeah, absolutely. I'm not saying it will, but could it? Sure. And if I had to guess, I'd put the highest probability at the dinar because of it. Uh, because of of the way that we have occupied them for a very long time in a very hypocritical fashion, and they're sick of it, and they want to get away from the West, making trading in dollars illegal right now. So, yeah, it could happen, but I think it will. I would simply say this. If you are fully invested in dollars, you're destined to go broke, and if you are not a contrarian, you're, you're destined to be a victim. Hmm. Well, thank you, Annie. That was quite a mouthful, quite a lot of articulation to to share, and, and you covered a lot of ground. So uh, I'm sure our viewers will be processing a lot of I told of you it'd be a long answer, but it's did. important to see the big picture yeah. or just getting pieces of it. Don't, it doesn't, they all have to be put together into a, a larger picture to see right. the stupidity of it. Either we're that stupid or we are trying to destabilize the country from within and destabilize the dollar outside. Put it together. Now you have your reset that is fostered by the rest of the world shedding dollars and treasuries in favor of something else, a new system on their end, which then allows us to reset most of the debt owed to us. We're sorry they did it to us. Take the CBDC and everything will be fine. No, you're right, because we talk to our viewers all the time, Andy, about seeing the puzzle pieces and how they interconnect. And you just you just articulated that. Don't forget, Iran also is another scapegoat for them because they want to bait them into war because they don't have a war. And I actually personally think just talking about it, I think Zimbabwe and Vietnam is really real because they have a ton of silver and other precious metals and resources. They have a great manpower. You look at China, right? A lot of their workforce has moved away from China. It's gone over to Vietnam in terms of manufacturing. So I see, we sort of see a domino effect, but uh, in, in terms of Zimbabwe, I, th I think they have some of the most amount of gold in the world, you probably know, and they got to get rid of their, they have a corruption problem, just like everybody else, not unlike us, who is the epicenter of, as you said, the aforementioned corruption. So as we see that disseminated, you'll have your bad reset, your great reset, and then the godly reset that we always talk about on our channel, which is based in God's money, gold and silver, and a whole bunch of other commodities to your point and Bill's point. So with all that being said, I know you're not God, you don't have a crystal ball, but when, from your historical replication, when do you see all these events playing out roughly? You know, I'm a big fan of the phrase logarithmic decay, which is like you're four miles upstream Niagara Falls, two, three, 400 years ago on a raft, just exploring, you know, and, and you start to notice the pitch slowly declining. And and more and more slowly declining. And you hear something off in the distance, you know, <sighs> little by little by little by little, it declines and bang all at once. And I don't know when that all at once moment is, but I will tell you the little by little by little by little by little, if you look, it's happening. I mean, five countries at BRICS, now 10, 36 have formally applied, all the OPEC countries on the Belt Road. Gold is now tier one. Central banks buying more gold than at any time in human history. 
you know, the destabilization and, and the whitewashing of our culture and our country, the little by little by little by little by little by little by little is happening. Now, when is the all at once moment? Probably on a Sunday night, on a Monday morning, we wake up to a new reality, but not until they have critical mass, not until they have the ability to stand up. They don't even have to issue a common settlement currency to do it. They can trade in their own local currencies. If we are a BRICS country, we will accept your currency and it can convert it into gold, which is the only other tier one asset. They can do that without even issuing a common settlement currency, which ultimately we are being told by the finance ministers that this is what they are working on. But until then, just not settling in dollars chips away at the settlement status, not buying bonds and instead of buying gold chips away at the reserve status little by little by little by little until they have enough of a swath of human population, of GDP, of military might, of shipping lanes, of of, of commodity production and, and, and accumulation. I mean, they already own the LME. They're buying all the gold. They're buying all the commodities. They have relationships all over the developing nations in Africa and South America where we don't. They're, we're coercive. They're cooperative. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the little by little. When is the all at once? Your guess is as good as mine. But I will tell you that I am shocked by how fast this has all happened. When I started talking about it in 2019, I wouldn't have guessed that it would have happened this fast. But I think it's, you know, look, you got the big BRICS meeting in October, you have election in November. Who knows? It could be any time between now and then. And, um, you know, I, I would really much rather see President Trump in, in the office, but I don't even know that he can stop it. He can slow it down. I mean, mathematics is is a big thing. And um, I don't know if we have the ability to to right the ills that we've already done. Maybe we do, maybe we don't. This country has has a history of of doing its best with its back to the wall. God willing, we do, but we've really put ourselves in a bad position. And God help us if the current administration stays in here, because I don't know that we'll have the same country another four years of this if we continue down this path of mismanagement of the world reserve currency, weaponizing of the dollar, and letting our country run astray. I just I I, I fear for the world my three children are growing up in. Mm. Mm. Okay. Well, fair enough. Thank you for that, Andy. Uh, so speaking of precious metals, because everything sort of intercorrelates with that, you see silver and gold, even oil starting to break to all time highs. It seems they can't stop it anymore. They can't manipulate it with, uh, you know, suppression of paper, you know, gold and silver certificates. Uh, it's running amok. Um, with that manipulation, where do you see it going in terms of the COMEX? And how high do you think gold and silver can actually go? I think you're right. They can't control it anymore because the BRICS nations, China, 17 straight months in a row. The Bank of Montreal analyst just came out and said they're buying way more than they're telling us. They're producing way more. Alistair McLeod thinks that China has um, 38,000 metric tons, uh, 20 by the, the state, 18, 000, 18 by the people, where we have like 8,300 metric tons and supposedly have the most in the world, which hasn't been audited since 1956. So... You know, I I would say to you that the COMEX is, has been for a very long time when they designed it, they said, let's design a system. And it's ironic that it was designed the day after the, that President Ford made gold legal again to own. Mm -hmm. And they said, let's make a system that I believe they said a system where gold will never get out of control because it's the antithesis of what we're doing. So what we'll do is we'll we'll make all of these contracts that we can create all of these paper contracts where many 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 times glo uh, global annual production is traded in a day and and it will be rehypothecated where you know there's 500 claims to every one contract and, and we'll do it that way and that will be pretend gold and and then the people all they got to do is have money in their margin account they don't even have to pay for it so they can pretend to pay for it if I buy a hundred ounce bar of gold right now or a contract rather. Because let's say I have 5,000 ounces of gold in my warehouse and I want to hedge it. I, I sell short 5,000 ounces on COMEX to hedge the 5,000 I have in my warehouse so I mark it neutral. I don't have to pay anything. The trade for that might be 100 bucks, 200 bucks, whatever it is. But the margin in my account, roughly seven, 8,000 bucks covers a 100 ounce contract. I can control, you know, 
twenty two hundred and thirty thousand in gold with eight nine thousand margin in my account. That's it. So I pretend to pay for it, and they pretend to deliver it or give it to me because no one ever stood for delivery back then. And China and India and and these countries were third world. They never stood for delivery, and now. They're draining the exchanges. And as we suppress the price, as the finance minister said, for the time being, the West controls it, but our new currency will change that. They have been using the suppression of COMEX to drain the LBMA and the COMEX and anything that's not nailed down. Now they're turning up the arbitrage where it's silver's three bucks higher in, in Shanghai and gold's 80 bucks higher. So they buy in the West and deliver in the East. They're draining the coffers. So you cannot be naked short in this environment it will put you out of business when a sovereign nation will stand for delivery and if you don't have it in a rising market you're dead in the water and so i would argue it i mean it seems different this time john it really does mm -hmm. i've never seen it like this in 34 years of business so i would say to you yeah it, it seems as though right now at least for the time being they've lost control of holding back the price of gold and now that it's past its all-time high, the sky's the limit. Who knows? I'll tell you that I learned long ago that bull markets will go higher than anyone ever thinks possible, and bear markets will fall lower. When I started in this industry, the Dow Jones was 2100 and the Nikkei was 39000 And Japan owned Rockefeller Center and Pebble Beach and casinos in Vegas. They just got back to where it was, just got back. After 34 years, it took them to get back to where they were when I started in this industry, the Nikkei. And so markets, you know, it fell 75% at one point. And the Dow Jones went from 2,100, you know, all the way up to what, almost 40 plus thousand. And, and, and back then Japan made anything with a motherboard or an engine way better than we did. They were taking over the world and bang, their, their Nikkei collapsed. It took a generation to come back. And our Dow Jones went way higher than anyone thinks possible, largely due to easy money and suppressed interest rates and and good times but things are changing and people need to understand that recency and normalcy bias is a very bad thing so yeah i i would say the price in an in an environment where, like we see right now where the world is rushing to it where it is being remonetized in favor of dollars and treasuries that can be sanctioned they're using it i believe to trade cross-border as money with as settlement with with other countries it will be the foundation of a new system a marriage of gold and blockchain a, a central bank digital system pegged to gold at a very high level maybe 20 percent of every new currency unit pegged to gold with the immutability and veracity for the whole world to see on the blockchain audited independently to give it credibility because if it's if it's not, like Kristalina Georgieva, the head of the IMF, IMF, just said, any central bank currency not pegged to something is just fiat. What's gold? Oh, yeah, the only other tier one reserve asset. Who's buying it? Oh, yeah, all the central banks who will reset the system. There's going to be a reset. It will be tied to gold at a much, much higher level. You do not buy gold to get wealthy. You buy gold because it is wealth, because it has outlived every you know, everything the world's ever thrown at it, two world wars, German hyperinflation, the Great Depression, every pandemic, everything. And so, yeah, how high does it go? Higher than most people think possible. And silver, probably the value proposition of a generation, uh, certainly of a decade. And uh, I think the sky's the limit for that too. And this is a metal that's just barely over half of its all-time peak. And there's a lot of runway left in silver, but you know, when you've broken through the resistance in gold and there's nothing above it, who knows? Who's to say what it's fairly priced at? Any more so than Bitcoin at 70,000, any more so than the Dow Jones at 38,000 when it was at 2100 when I started in this industry. So who knows? But uh, I expect much higher. I agree. I mean, also too, Andy, consider the fact that silver is the backbone of manufacturing, the new AI robotic technology. It's in everything that we use and consume, as you know. Uh, so I'd say there's more uh, of, a, of a run on silver. Not only gold. that, there's 500 ounces in the tip of every Tomahawk cruise missile. And I've had that verified by a consultant from the Department of Defense. 500 ounces in the tip of every Tomahawk. Look at the missiles that are being shot all over the world right now. Mm. I mean, silver, boom, gone, 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 gone. And then it's it's used in tiny little amounts in anything digital or electronic, mm -hmm. in landfills, anything that conducts electricity over the last 80 yeah. years, in landfills. 
it's coming out of the ground at seven to one, yet it's being priced at 80 to one because of the Western suppression. It'll right. bankrupt companies. It'll bankrupt banks that do this. That's why they're backing away from it. India imported 400 million ounces last year. That's 10 times more than the registered category on COMEX, the bars that are backing the contracts. The countries are accumulating the commodities and they don't care about the relationships or the inverse relationships between a strong dollar or interest rates. None of that. They want the real stuff and they're buying it and they're draining the exchanges right out from underneath us as as the people in this country have no idea what's happening. And gold has gotten no fanfare, no public participation, nothing. It's it's just crazy. Yeah, agreed. And to your point also, uh, solar panels as well, you know, two ounces per panel. So it's just in everything. It's replete everywhere we go. Good segue, actually, to your, to your point, Andy, about uh, watching a, a recent show with uh, with you, I think, with Big Swear on Road to Ruta. He was talking about the U.S. Mint failing to keep up with the demand of sil silver egos, silver eagles. What do you uh, contribute that to? And do you think there's a reason why the Treasury and the, the banks don't want people to have uh, silver eagles in particular? Maybe they just don't have enough silver. He did a three part interview uh, with Jack Sermon, the guy that developed the Eagle program. And he the guy I, I almost fell off my chair and he, everyone should watch it. Uh, where the guy said his superiors came to him and said, we want you to make just as few silver eagles as you can to to um, to hold back public outcry. For the past four years, they have not been able to keep up with demand whatsoever. And it's, it's crazy, actually. So, yeah, I think uh, with all of the states that are passing legislation to allow gold and silver to be legal tender for all debts, public and private, including paying property tax for all the states that are removing sales tax, uh, yeah, I think it's a big deal, and and I think you, the premiums on Silver Eagles can and will go parabolic like they were for the last three years. Actually, we have them on sale right now at $5.50 over the price of silver, and if anyone wants to send us an email at info at milesfranklin.com and request our price list, which is way better than the prices on our website, which we only allow up to 10000 on the website, ask for the price list, say, John Dowling sent me, and you'll get our specials, you'll get our prices, which are amongst the very, very, very best in the nation. And um, Silver Eagles, I think, are, I, I, we had to limit it to 1500 per client because they aren't producing that many, but um, they are in stock. They're 2024s and, and ready to go. And it's my, my choice of what to own, Silver and Gold Eagles, for sure. Okay, so, you know, you're answering a lot of the questions on Silver, the kind of wrapped and in, intertwined my other questions. So I'll just pivot to the next one. Uh, there's a lot of talk in the, the whole of society and in our, even in our community about a contentious debate about Bitcoin. So I wanted to get your perspective on it. Do you see it as a good or a bad investment? Is it a true store of wealth for the future? And, and what do you think will be backing it in the future? I mean, it, it's gaining quite a bit of, of attention and adoption. I am um, not someone who believes that it has to be, they have to be mutually exclusive of one another. Um, look, all the central banks of the world don't own Bitcoin, they own gold. With that being said, there there is something intriguing about Bitcoin to me. I won't, I won't um, say that it doesn't come with a good amount of risk. I don't think it's digital gold, but I, I do think that that it it's okay to have it in a portfolio and to to realize that broad diversification right now is a mistake between you know stocks bonds and real estate you think you're broadly diversified no you're not you're you are diverse you are not diversified at all everything is opposite the dollar or in 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 denominated in dollars when you talk about the way to succeed is to me you identify the primary trend that is of a a dollar in trouble and if a dollar in trouble is the primary trend, then you jump into the river with both feet uh, of the primary trend, like the Mississippi River, you know, it goes from Minnesota to the Gulf of Mexico. You jump in with both feet uh, and you broadly diversify within it. You buy precious metals, uh, you buy agricultural ETFs or farmland, you buy oil and gas, uh, uh, you know, stocks or ETFs. You can buy some Bitcoin. You diversify within the primary trend of a falling dollar. So, you know, I am not an expert on Bitcoin, but I'm not a Bitcoin hater. I own a little bit of it. I think it would be foolish to not. A lot of people think it is foolish to own it. I don't. I, and I, I think that, um, you know, I don't want to look back at, 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 and say, you know, I, I should have known better. I, I want to have a little bit of allocation to it. 
But look, a five or a 10% allocation in your portfolio to Bitcoin could make you wealthy. Who knows? See, to me, the difference between Bitcoin and gold is that we both go into the same door for the same reason. And that is we understand what's happening to the dollar and to the system. But the difference is the people that I sell gold to go one way, and that is of return of investment. Uh, it's not about profit. It's about safety. It's about protection. It's about insurance. The people who are focusing on Bitcoin, you could argue, are more greedy. They're looking for profit. They're looking for a big appreciation. But we all have the same understanding of fiat currency. So I don't think we should be mutually exclusive of one another. I think for those who own precious metals and those who own Bitcoin, there should be a little bit of each. If you own Bitcoin and have made a tremendous amount, you can take some of that profit off the table and put it into gold and silver and own both. To be adversarial with one another is wrong. And I think it's not the right idea. In fact, they should complement one another. So I think there's nothing wrong with owning some Bitcoin. Um, I don't look at it the same way I do as gold. I look at it as, as speculative, non-dollar investment. But I think it would be foolish to ignore just how profound its gain has been. And I think Bill would really disagree with me on that. If he were sitting here with me, he'd probably punch me in the arm. And he's got really <laughs> rock-solid hands. And uh, But... You know, I, I just, being married to your own ideology is a mistake. So I am willing, and I have been for a little while now, to put a little bit on a routine basis into Bitcoin. Not enough to, to, to where I'll miss it if it goes to zero, but enough to make me feel like, geez, you know, here I am talking about the merits of non-dollar denominated assets, the merits of breaking away from the, the, the fiat system, and I shouldn't have ignored it. So I, I dabble a little bit, and I guess the moral of the story is it doesn't have to be one or the other. Okay, fair enough. Thank you for that. Last question for today. Uh, we'll pick this up on, on our next show. Uh, as you're probably aware, XRP is in the process of, of winning its case against the SEC, no longer being labeled security. What implications does that have for XRP as well as cryptos and for the future for Gary Gensler and the SEC? Well, I think it has, you know, some very significant applications if indeed it is adopted by, you know, the banks. We're seeing it uh, adopted by some of the BRICS nations. And and, and I think that um, it's a big deal. You know, here again, you don't have to go all into these investments. You should have a little bit. I'll be speaking at the XRP convention uh, in um, Las Vegas next month. I believe enough in it to own a little bit of it. I, I don't put all my money into it, but I own a little Bitcoin. I own a little Theta. I own a little XRP. And, and there's nothing wrong with being diversified into this sector rather than just blanketly looking at it as, as something that is, is, you know, digital error, so to speak. But the one thing I like about XRP and the one thing I like about Theta is that they both provide utility. They are not just a token. They provide utility. And an XRP network does provide a good deal of utility. And it does allow for much faster settlement. And it does allow for things that would be beneficial to a banking system. I think the one place that, that I deviate from the crypto crowd as it pertains to where these things fit into the ecosystem down the road is I believe that it will be very difficult to have a, a decentralized system administered or okayed by, by a government. A central authority is not going to allow decentralization. It doesn't mean that, that there isn't place for Bitcoin or XRP in, in the ecosystem. There is. It's just that, uh, you know, I think it's going to come with certain challenges, but but those like Bitcoin, like XRP, like Theta, those that have utility, those that are legitimate, I think it would be foolish for people to ignore them. Put 5% of your assets into it, into your investable assets, and I think it would be worth the gamble, especially in the light of the SEC backing off. Fair enough. All right, well, Andy, uh, this is the point where the show where we basically ask people where they can find out about your work and last thoughts you have for the audience today. Yeah, well, of course, milesfranklin.com. We did just recently issue a new website. We have a new one that's coming out in June. Um, but for our competitive price list that we don't publish, 
uh, uh, online is info at milesfranklin.com. You can ask any questions about anything you've seen on this show. You can ask for the price list. You can ask about precious metals IRAs or 401ks. Anything that you are interested in, you can feel free to um, to ask. And Or if you just want the price sheet, that's fine. You'll find all sorts of information in previous videos I've done on, on milesfranklin.com. But info at milesfranklin.com and say John Dowling sent me and you'll be given uh, uh, our best price on a price list and and a white glove service on any questions that uh, that your listeners may have it would be our honor to to help them for sure sounds great thanks again andrew for being on the on the, pro, the uh, podcast we look forward to seeing you again shortly and uh, we really appreciate your time thanks again yeah i'd love to come on on a regular basis john i love the way you're thinking and and uh, i would be honored so um i look forward to picking up where we left off and i look forward to talking to you real soon Appreciate it. Sounds good. All right. Take Thank care. You, John.